So quick about me, the long journey, um, basically these days I'm an independent um, web developer, um, independent freelance consultant, but I've been all kinds of things, um, software developer, build engineer, project manager, um, more recently Nepal Trekker, I just snuck that one in from last month. Um, so when you're like a, um, a freelance web developer, you, you, you just find that from time to time people find you um, like community groups and they'd like you to build a map for them. Um, totally reasonable. Um, they generally don't have a budget at all. And you want to help them. You'd like to be able to build them something that meets their needs. They start off, they say, we need a map. Often what they really mean is they want a database of some kind. Then the requirements start to come out. Okay, so it's a map, it's got pins on it. Okay, pins, that means point data, right? Great, sort of translate it. Uh, they'll usually have requirements about what it looks like. They'll sort of start pretty vague and then, you know, you talk to them a bit more and it's like, yeah, it's got to look like this kind of thing. Wait, actually more like, uh, more like that. Um, so the point I'm making here is there'll be some sort of um, requirement for customization and uh, that will often emerge over time. Um, so I tend to want to build something that's JavaScript-y uh, with the full power of CSS for stuff around the map and, and a lot of custom styling in the map itself. They'll want it to maybe match their existing branding. Um, usually not too hard if you've got control over the CSS. Uh, then suddenly later on, oh, it's got to work really well on mobile, which they never mentioned at the start. Uh, then, oh Jesus, and we all need to update the data all at once, simultaneously. Okay, things are getting more complicated. Oh, and also we don't actually know anything about geospatial data. They've probably never heard the word geospatial. <laughs> that one kind of emerges on, oh, and also, um, yeah, we want to be able to keep maintaining the data long after you've left and moved on to other things which is actually kind of cool. So basically, the, the situation you end up with is you're building an interactive web map some, for some people. Um, they're going to maintain the data. You don't have the time or effort to teach them geospatial. It's only point data. They probably don't, probably don't need a complicated geo stack. Um, so what do you do? How do you, how do you build it? Um, some examples of where this has come up in the past. The briefly hilarious hipster map of Melbourne, which made page three of our major broadsheet newspaper, The Age. Um, you know, I can build the, the front end, but it's more interesting if someone else is actually maintaining the, the data um, within the platform and writing all the snarky descriptions. You should check it out. Google hipster map of Melbourne. It's still around. It's all, as you would expect, uh, half the places have now closed down because, um, you know, things to the hipster don't, don't stick around very long. Um, so there's some really amusing descriptions in there. Um, or this one more recently, this is uh, running the, the Good Karma Network uh, for a group called the Good Karma Effect. They have lots of local community groups and they wanted this simple site where you type in your address and it tells you here's your nearest um, Good Karma Effect uh, local network to, to join. Simple idea, right? Um, not super complicated to implement, but again, they want to maintain the data. I just build the thing and then I walk away. Uh, and this is obviously matching their, their branding. Um, or this example, which I built for random hacks of kindness. Uh, I think I set a personal record from the time that I met them to the time I shipped it uh, with a domain name just over three hours. Um, so that's why it's kind of ugly. Um, so the requirements in this one are um, you're someone who's looking for a doctor um, and uh, you want them to be LGBT friendly. Um, you know, if you're a lesbian, you want a lesbian friendly doctor. If you're trans, you want uh, a, a doctor who actually has experience working with trans patients. Uh, so the thing at the top left is a filter. So maybe you're, you want someone uh, who um, has experience with both lesbian and trans uh, patients. So you can like tick on both of those boxes and then it'll just filter down the whole, um, like all, all the available doctors. And here we've just shown on the map LB means lesbian and bi experience. Um, yeah, simple concept, but the, nothing like that existed. Again, they want to maintain the data separately and they don't want to have to like bug me every time they've got a, a data update. So how do we do that? Like what's, what's an actual mechanism um, to construct that? What's, what's the tech stack that we can use? So in times gone past, the answer was Cardo. Um, Cardo was great. Uh, previously known as Cardo DB. Uh, had a wide range of visualizations um, directly in the platform. Often I could just point people to Carto and if they were somewhat tech, tech savvy, I, 
literally just telling them Carto, and that was like the last I heard of them, they could figure it out. If they were less tech savvy, I'd kind of walk them through, set up a thing, leave them to it. It, it uh, had a great GUI, um, a table-based editor. Um, so you could either edit in geospatial mode or in table mode. Um, put in as many attributes as you want. You could even do um, PostGIS queries directly from the browser, which is really underutilized, but really cool. JavaScript um, API. You might be getting the sense there's a big butt coming. Oh my God, they changed the pricing. The pricing used to be free. And Cato's definition of individual pricing designed for individuals and freelancers for the low, low price of 199 US dollars per month. I can tell you as an individual and a freelancer, uh, that is approximately 10 times outside my price range. <laughs> I reckon 20 bucks a month I'd maybe pay. I mean, $200 a month is just, oh boy. So, not Carto. Uh, another potential platform that I've used a couple of times and I've seen in, not, not actually named, but I've seen in some other slides that people have shown uh, is UMAP. Um, which is actually a really nice collaborative mapping platform for people who have some basic spatial experience. It's kind of complex, but the complexity kind of matches the power. Um, it's got all these great features. So it's really good if you've got tons of layers. Um, it supports you know, points and lines and polygons. Um, you can customize pretty much everything. Um, you can have, you know, this layer is green and that layer is blue, uh, except for this individual feature is this one specific color and different kinds of icons and different kinds of interactions. And maybe there's a sidebar or there isn't and custom base maps and, you know, access control. These people can edit, those people can view, um, edit, but, you know, it's, um, it's great. It's really powerful. Um, and of course, it's completely free and open source. It's based on Python. Um, yeah, it's great. But, so there's kind of a but here. Um, if all you're looking for is something to edit the data collaboratively with people, it's kind of overkill because you can't turn off all that style editing stuff. Um, there's really annoyingly no API, which is kind of mind blowing sometimes. So you create all this data, but the only way to get <laughs> the data out of it is to actually log into it, click the buttons and click download GeoJSON. So you can't really use it as your um, it's your database. Like it's not a platform to build stuff on. Um, falls apart with large data sets because it, it doesn't use vector tiles or anything. It loads all the data directly into the browser. Can't edit concurrently. Craps out. You'll, like, you know, delete each other's work. Um, and it's just, it's a bit too much for beginners. Uh, I tried it with a research group and uh, it, it wasn't great. Then I had an epiphany. Well, no, that's, that's, that's going too far. I had a slide. Uh, everyone loves spreadsheets. I'm just um, going to leave the asterisk there and you can all in your mind fill in what, 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 what should be written next to the asterisk. Um, so I use spreadsheets now to power the sites that I build. Uh, so in the case of the Good Karma Network, it's Vue.js is the kind of framework for the whole thing, starting with the template, which I'll show. Uh, Mapbox GLJS. Uh, which I'm super familiar with. It's kind of my bread and butter uh, for the mapping bit. And then there's Google Sheets hiding behind the scenes, lurking there with this dastardly CSV API. So why would we want to use Google Sheets as our database? Well, everyone knows it. And if they don't know it, they know Excel and it's close enough. Um, it's really, really robust on concurrent editing. It won't fall apart. Um, supports commenting, supports history, all these kind of other little features that you wouldn't really think about. That um, it's actually be useful being able to like unwind when people have messed up your your database, um, or adding little you know comments, things to fix, all that meta information, who edited what cell. That's actually pretty useful sometimes. There's a whole ecosystem built around Google Sheets. There are other tools that tap into it. You can add little plugins. There's, so you can have like workflows around it. And Google Sheets has been around quite a while already and I really get the feeling it is not going anywhere. I would bet a lot of money it's gonna be there in two years. I'd bet quite a lot it's gonna be there in five years and I'd you know, probably take some sort of bet it'll be there in 10 years. And that's kind of crazy longevity in this world. 
And the CSV API is like the undocumented little, you know, surprise packet um, that makes all this stuff work really well. I have to admit, I didn't actually realize the CSV API existed when I um, wrote the abstract for this talk. Um, cool. Okay, so the two steps when you're making a, a Google Sheet as your database for a, a mapping website like this is first you share the document itself, um, the spreadsheet so that other people can add stuff into. We've probably all done this before. But then the second secret bit is publish to the web, which is kind of hidden there sneakily under the file menu where you wouldn't expect to find it. Um, you publish it, you choose CSV. Not too tricky. And you'll get this handy little URL. And when you go to that URL, you know what you get? No, you get a CSV file. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a trick. <laughs> uh, Cool. So, so when I'm building a thing like this, uh, I've just built my own little map template. Um, I have to admit, like, so it's online, but I hadn't really built it for the purpose of other people using it. But hey, go ahead. Um, so that gets you quite far because these, you know, I was building a few of these things, and they're all kind of similar. Um, so it gives you like a Vue.js template, and it loads Mapbox, and you know, a bunch of other little things. Then we're going to need to write some code. Well, as a JavaScript developer, that's <coughs> what I do. Um, so I'm just including this to show how little code there is really. Uh, I use something like D3, so the D3 fetch library. I pass in the CSV URL, and that little bit of code is going to grab our CSV file when the web page loads. <coughs> the next bit is we convert the CSV to GeoJSON, and I've written this code so many times. It, it's sort of not worth having a library to do it for you, so we ended up just writing it. Um, essentially, you're just constructing the GeoJSON object in the browser. So a GeoJSON object is going to have a type, a feature collection. It's going to have an array of features. Each feature is going to have a type of feature. It's going to have a geometry object. And in our case, uh, each row in the Google Sheet is going to uh, represent a point. So it's going to have a type of point and the coordinates. Um, Here's the bit where we actually reference the names of the columns. So in this particular spreadsheet, the longitude column is called lung, and the latitude column is called lat. And we do this sneaky thing where we put a plus sign in front of those column names, and that tells JavaScript to kind of smush it into a number type. Um, it's just a way of doing type conversion. Most of the, way, most of the ways that JavaScript does type conversion suck, uh, but this one's useful. Um, and the last little bit... It still uh, sucks though, doesn't it? JavaScript? I, that, I mean, it's useful, but it sucks, right? You're right. It sucks and useful. <laughs> uh, and then finally, all the other attributes of the entire row, we can just jam into the properties object so that every point in our map has the full attributes that represents the entire row. Uh, and then finally, having uh, fetched our CSV, converted into GeoJSON, we're going to add it to our map with Mapbox GeoJS. Uh, so we'll add a source of type GeoJSON and we'll add a way of representing that data using pins. Hopefully we've loaded our icons before this bit. Um, so this is really like, if you've worked with Mapbox GeoJS, this is really basic. This is um, sort of 101 stuff. The main reason I'm showing this is just to say, yeah, that's, you know, that's all the code for the entire guts of this, um, uh, yeah, the, the representation of the data. And that actually, yeah, surprisingly brings me to the end of my presentation, but I have some extra slides just in case anyone needs. So questions? <laughs> actually, I might even also show the, um, the, the live demo of the, <laughs> the, the site while we're here and while the microphone is moving around. Um, so great, hit me up. Hi, um, just to say great presentation, like, um, what you just talked about just solves a problem that we currently have with um, um, an issue we have back home. My question is just to ask about like any new points that come in. For example, if you enter new data into the spreadsheet, does it automatically update on the map as it goes? Or uh, yes, um, yeah. If you're using the CSV API, um, that, well, the next time the user refresh their browser, it would uh, automatically load. That data would be taken into account immediately. Um, if you needed it to be more 
immediate than that, then you could just build that into the, the browser in an automatic sort of polling loop or something like that. But I haven't had a, a use case like that yet. Um, up to date in my world usually means like within a few weeks. Um, but yeah, if you're talking like, you know, sub second timing, that'd be something a bit different. I'll just ask my questions after to you. Do you find that people have trouble typing in latitude, longitude coordinates, and do you do any um, like uh, testing that they're in reasonable bounds? Um, often the data sets I'm working with are small enough that you can kind of go through by hand and, and immediately pick out any that are wrong. And yeah, obviously people make mistakes because people are people, and you know they might put coordinates in the wrong hemisphere or something, or um, Another thing you can do is, uh, have you ever heard of geocoding? Um, <laughs> here's a slide I prepared earlier. Um, so if, if they're really not comfortable with, um, you know, if, if lat longs aren't a thing they've got, then you can actually use this amazing plugin to Google Sheets called Geocode by Awesome Table. And they can provide addresses and then you run the, this step um, and it will literally geocode those addresses into, uh, into lat longs. So that's another really useful thing you, you can do for working around like if if even that level of geoliteracy is is too much then uh, that's a useful solution is that still restricted to a number of uh, entries at once though oh probably i could probably have a limit like a, a thousand a day or something no 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 no, 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 no. try like 20 it used to be oh um i'm just i'm just saying i'm just warning people so it's possible I, I think i looked at a brief like just before yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah geocoding oh my god there's a whole world <laughs> Right. Yeah. If you need lots of geocoding, then um, can I recommend my other website um, <laughs> called getlon.lat? And boy, did I put a lot of work into researching every freaking geocoding plan out there to build this whole like comparison tool. You, you, yeah. If you need X number of geocodes per month or per day or whatever. Oh boy, oh, there's a lot of geocoding plans out there. Oh, so many geocoding, oh, just, whew, a lot of geocoders. Any other questions? Did you write one of those? No, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> um, I also have need for a community-based website with a map. Um, so what do you end up with? Just basically JavaScript file in a GitHub that you can... I was totally gonna add a slide about that, yeah. So I, I published the thing to GitHub pages. Uh, and that's actually built into that, that template um, site. Yeah. Uh, it, it's already got like a script in there. Um, these days it's quite easy to just uh, push up to GitHub pages. You don't need to make a separate branch in the GitHub repo. You can just make a subdirectory and, and there's a bit of configuration. Yeah, I should probably actually write something about that. Because once you've done it a couple of times, then yeah, Thank publishing you. to GitHub pages works really smoothly. Uh, great idea. How do you actually stop people changing the uh, titles on the top line, or is <laughs> so? Because I don't like LNG. I like LONG, and I'm going to change it. And now my map doesn't work anymore. That brings me to my other hidden slide. <laughs> if you went through the JSON API instead of the CSV API, it wouldn't be dependent on the name of the the column, um, and then you could access the column by its um, position, so it would just be the third column, and even if they, they muck that up, then you're still good. Uh, if they reorder the columns, then you might need some extra smarts to try and like figure out where have they hidden their, their latitudes and longitudes this time. Um, <laughs> if that fails, it might be time for a difficult conversation. Might be one more. Yeah, we've got time for a couple more. Yeah. Um, so after you've made one of these for a client, and they call you the next day and they ask for support for lines and polygons, what do you say? Oh, that's great. Um, that's the freemium model. So, so then I, I upgrade them to a, you know, an individual consulting plan. Um, yeah, we have a, a different kind of conversation and I you know, send them a, a proposal. Um, yeah, so you're probably not gonna wanna try and jam polygons and lines into a Google Sheets. Uh, I'm sure you could try it using like WKT or something along those lines. Um, Another option, actually, this is my last secret slide. This is great. Um, I'd probably recommend something like geojson.io. Um, so this is a pretty convenient way of allowing people 
who again, not very spatial, um, to create some basic spatial data. Not great on the concurrent editing or any of those things. Um, but when someone just needs to create a polygon and send you a polygon, um, this is a pretty good tool. And I just wish it had sort of better storage options. It, it can save stuff to GitHub. Um, Tom McWright for a while, was uh, who I think worked on the original version, his, was working on a new version called geojson.net. Uh, I don't know where that got to. Um, that was supposed yeah, to solve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know he now works at um, Observable. Uh, yeah, he, he was still working on it for a while. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is this is one of the, the solutions for extracting polygon and line data out of non-spatial people. And I've used it a few times for that kind of purpose, and it, it works okay because it does so little. It only does that one thing. It turns out to be a really useful feature. <laughs>